I'm so grateful for your, your patience for um, uh, you know, having to, to abbreviate here. Okay. Um, what I'm going to present is, is falls far short of, of what I desire in terms of a structure. Um, I, I, I'm looking for a way to structure this better, but I hope it will land in appreciation for certain broad areas um, where we can fruitfully conduct analysis. I hope further that it will stir up some ideas that might be helpful for, for you. Um, um, one observation I will say here is, is true across the board for all studies, regardless of study type, making best use of, of the data collected requires analysis. There's a, there's a certain tendency to view the hard part as being getting the data. And you know, there's, there's a whole human theater of that. So I, I get that that's really challenging and important. Uh, and we're right to celebrate it when we, when we have a lot of data that's come in um, with good quality, et cetera. But you know, really, that's the start of the, uh, having that um, puts us in a position, it opens up the opportunity to really deliver value from that data. Value beyond you know, the, the insights that come from running a, a study. And um, there's, in the context of Ethica and in the context of smartphone wearable based data collection, while there are studies out there which make use purely of, um, of mechanisms from, uh, you know, from surveys um, and conduct more traditional analysis using said, said uh, instruments, um, there was the, you know, the, the data collected by said instruments. Um, to make use of, of the sensor side of things, whether it's uh, aspects of, of lending context to those or finding appropriate measures or understanding what was going on at the time they answered something, et cetera, to link them to certain, certain um, not directly observable outcomes. Um, we typically have to bring some tools. Um, machine learning, computational statistics, and dynamic modeling are, are three, three broad areas um, of great uh, significance here. And much of our work has been conducted with past Ethica studies, and indeed pre-Ethica studies to which Mohammed contributed greatly um, when he wore a younger man's shoes. Um, uh, we've used these methods to get some, some really nice um, analytic insights. Um, and uh, there's a variety of techniques here that I'd be glad to go into with those who, who would like to, to, um, to dive deeper. But I want to I want to note a few regularities, a few fundamental regularities here. One is the fact that when we talk about analysis, um, we're kind of glomming together a bunch of different types of analytics. Okay, um, and typically when we deal with this data, there's many stages of engagement um, where we'll go through some summary stages early on, some data cleaning stages, um, data scrubbing, um, and, and we, we lead up to some more sophisticated forms. Chin Yang in yonder corner, um, for example, has done uh, much work with that um, uh, in, in much of our machine learning work. And Broadly, if I could put down some common stages, recognizing they're not universal, often early on we do data cleaning and filtering. Let me give you some examples. Mohammed didn't mention them. Um, uh, but GPS data, one thing we used to know is some of our earliest studies pre-Ethica, we noticed that participants who, who had GPS data, not only sometimes would be missing, but sometimes it would place them in the most unlikely locations. One common place was off the coast of Nigeria. They were, they were placed just off, well, there's actually a couple hundred kilometers off the Nigerian coast. And 
It turns out that that's point zero zero zero. I think of the coordinate system for GPS. I think it's on the prime meridian or something. And and it was due to a you know a, an error in measurement, you could say, of the GPS system from which the phone gets its data. Probably because it couldn't see the satellites properly or something like that. Maybe they were in an urban canyon or inside a big building and. Maybe it so happened that it, it, it um, lost contact with the satellite at the wrong point, didn't realize it, and, and gave them the wrong location. Another popular one from Saskatchewan was our antipodes, our 180 degrees on the other side of the world, which is somewhere in Indonesia, I think. So people would appear in Indonesia for a couple of minutes, and then they'd pop back to Saskatchewan. <laughs> um, the, you know, the, 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 the pipe dream of Bali. Um, and um, we're not only so for the graduate students involved, but, um, but the point is we had to clear, clean that data. Um, we, had to, we had to say those are not real data points. Those are artifacts. And uh, it's somewhat similar with some of the other, other measures. Um, there's, um, there's some data that can be thrown out here because it's, it's not meaningful. I'll, I'll throw, I'll, I'll toss another one out there. This is a recurrent issue. This is so part of my day-to-day -day experience. <laughs> Forget about these things. Um, so most studies, we have issues about um, when did that participant actually begin the study? I mentioned this the other day. Like what was their official start time? Because sometimes they may download the app in advance of that, particularly if it's remote, and then they go through a consent form and say, yes, they're willing to consent. But sometimes they futz around with things a little bit. Um, uh, sometimes it's been the study organizer showing them how to use the app, and they fill out a couple surveys. They say, and we also have this survey when you are experiencing distress, um, you know, gastrointestinally, you'll use these buttons, this is how you fill it out. Why don't you give it a try? And they try it. But that data is not meaningful for a patient. You know, it's not meaningful participant data. Um, some of it is from the study organs, some from others. Another example is um, uh, we have sometimes um, people who are study organizers who join the study to test it out and their data is mixed in with participants. And we don't, we don't want their data because they're not a participant. They're a, it's an artifact, right? They're a study organizer. It's just, it's in the Ethica database. So we got to throw that out. So often there's a certain amount just throwing out. Now a really well-planned study can avoid that. Cheryl's studies are like pearls. Um, uh, you know, she, you know, I think she gets, she has profound wisdom because she deals not only with people, but four-legged variants. Um, uh, you know, animals with horns too, and uh, and so she knows how to deal with you know with these sort of things, often anticipating them ahead of time, in in ways that um, you know takes longer for us to figure out. So there's some data cleaning. Then there's often an aggregation step. Often for the analysis, we'll aggregate the data up to a coarser resolution. By coarser, you may think I've talked about days. No, I'm actually talking about like seconds or something. So that may sound strange, but if you're dealing with accelerometry data, or if you're dealing with gyroscope data, often you'll get many measurements a second, and you may, you may want to summarize up. In other cases, it might be to a day at a time, and you want to know for that day, what was their exposure to outdoor versus indoor environments. And so you aggregate up to the level of the day and you compute things at the level of the day. For Tina's calculation, Tina's a quite sophisticated machine learning algorithm to really pin down quite precisely how much screen time is someone getting. And she aggregates up to a second level, the level of each second for how long they're, um, uh, and whether, they're uh, whether the phone state is, is on or off basically, and uh, the screen. Um, beyond that, often we end up doing simple classification. So we may wonder, like, during that second, or during that minute, or during that hour, or during that day, or what have you, is there a contact measured with another participant? So, like, was I, did my Bluetooth 
did my phone detect your Bluetooth beacon? And if so, I'll measure a contact. Um, and some, sometimes it's more complicated than that. It's like, okay, I see your beacon, you don't see mine. Does that count as a contact? And we have some rule about, yeah, if either one sees each other, it's a contact. Or no, both have to see each other. And so there's some sort of logic often associated with this, like simple classification, like, okay, was there a contact or not? Um, and then sometimes we, we get more complex. This, this actually has some machine learning that we often, often apply. Um, maybe it should be in this next component here. But often we end up doing some statistical modeling, machine learning, maybe it's as simple as a logistic regression, maybe it's something more sophisticated like hidden Markov model. These days it may be a deep, deep learning network, um, recurrent neural network, or, or less commonly in this context, convolutional neural network. Um, and then often we'll do some dynamic model. We have a simulation model and we'll use some of this data to inform the simulation model, to calibrate it or to parameterize it or to filter it, uh, filter in an in a engineering sense, meaning to kind of correct it as it predicts over time and correct those predictions. And so dynamic modeling plays a role in this. And many papers are published only like up to this uh, point or only up to, to, to this point. There's some insights that can come, but to really link it to the highest level, like policy choice or impacts on a person's, um, uh, you know, uh, that, that relate to a person's treatment pathways or, or understanding broad effects associated with their, um, their clinical prognosis uh, associated with staying current with medication, often you end up going to this level. Why? Because you're dealing with a lot of data, you're dealing with, um, with uh, sensor data, and you're trying to make sense of what does it tell us, for example, predictability in their day-to-day -day patterns tell us about their likelihood of, of taking that medication? We might use a, a Bayesian model to link the two to kind of say, you know, with this level of predictability as a covariate, what's the likelihood we will have, you know, um, um, uh, a, uh, a gap in, in their adherence to the medication? Um, as indicated on Ethica by taking photos or by their self-reporting in response to a question. So typically there's kind of different levels of analysis and some papers get published at different levels. We publish quite a bit at, at this level just about summary of a study and what it, you know, maybe adherence measures, feasibility. But then often we end up, end up taking it to a deeper level to try to, to try to get the, the greatest amount of insight out of it, we often end up taking it further. So Cheryl study, the Cheryl we, we, we uh, the, the Cheryl, um, the study that we conduct with Cheryl, uh, we conduct with Cheryl on food board illness, um, you know, it's kind of hit prime time and a number of papers have come out and we have a master's thesis which is grinding slowly, which combines it with dynamic modeling and machine learning and have some early results from that. And, and it, it takes, takes a while to bring it to its full conclusion. But the point is, um, some of this work gets done earlier, it's easier, some, and often it involves different people. Like here, I bring, often I'm working with colleagues in math and stats. Um, here, well, this is my happy place, um, and I think it's Cheryl's happy place uh, as well these days. But. Um, uh, you know, this classification, a lot of this is, is, is machine learning and, um, and stuff, which is kind of in our wheelhouse, but um, different people could take on different jobs. Statistical Consulting Center could do a lot of the statistical work, um, biostatisticians, uh, statisticians, et cetera. So there's a bunch of different layers of analysis. And a given study may only go so far, but often going further means uh, potential for additional, unearthing additional insights. Okay, um, so I want to make a few distinctions here, and one of the things I aspire to do always with my teaching, with my students, is to try to get a read of what people in the audience don't need me to tell them and what they do. And often I'm, I'm far off in my judgment, and I, I apologize if some of these things are seem so obvious to not bare distinction. Um, 
we distinguish in terms of analysis from different types or locations, I could say. Here I talk too much like a computer scientist um, to an audience that don't need that. But um, there's a certain amount of analysis in Ethica that goes on on phone. Meaning like while Ethica is running, it's figuring certain things out. For example, it figures out whether you're likely moving or not. Because if you're not moving, it needn't measure GPS frequently. And that allows it big power savings. And that's really important for keeping Ethica app installed. So people don't say, what is this thing burning through my battery, you know, out of there. Um, so it's important in the human theater of, of motivating people to stay uh, connected. It's also important for not getting Ethica ejected from memory sometimes by saying, you're a bad application, go stand in the corner, which actually happens a lot. Um, uh, so it, 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 it will, I don't know if you see this, Android or iPhone, you'll sometimes see on Android, it'll say like, this application is using a lot of power. Have you ever seen that sort of thing? Yeah. Okay, on Android, it, it's a pretty frequent thing for me. It'll say like, Google Maps is using a lot of power. Do you want to kill it or something? Well, it doesn't quite ask it that way, but it, you know, like uh, you should know this is, is using a lot of power. And, and I might go kill it if it's, if it's doing that because say, oh, I don't need that. Um, and someone might say with Ethica, I don't need that, right? Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I've got to keep my battery going. And so it's, it's an important thing. So on phone analysis goes on, but it takes power um, to do it. <laughs> And so there's a certain amount you do to limit your power consumption, to be a bit smarter about using your battery. But most analysis tends to be pretty light. You, you don't want to do too much there. You may, you may suck power itself. So there's this balance. And we have done some on-phone analysis for like, are you indoors or outdoors? Or are you sitting, standing, or lying down? That sort of classification. But um, these days, we don't tend to do that, amongst other things, um, not wanting to put load on the phone. Now, then there's some other types of analysis that can offer more immediate feedback. So there's certain types of analysis. Ethica collects data, sends it to the mothership, and actually there's analysis done by Ethica software on that that may do something, like will trigger a condition um, that you, know, you, you have been in the presence of this and it may trigger um, trigger a, a thing or it will um, send you a survey or what have you. Um, but most analyses that we do are what I call offline. This is a, an old term in computer science which predates the, the internet as we know it. But basically it means it's not done in the day-to-day -day process as a key part of delivering you know, uh, effective response to new incoming data It's done every time to make some immediate decision or anything. Instead, it's, it's kind of like the data is collected and then we, we, we dive into doing the analysis at whatever point. It's not, it's not needed to deliver or continue to deliver the study. And so most of the analysis, the heavy duty analysis we do is at this stage. It doesn't need to require Muhammad. It's just sitting on the Ethica servers and we go and we analyze it in R. We use Python, we use Spark, we use you know, various, uh, various packages to analyze it. And it's offline. Um, this doesn't require Mohammed to do any modifications to the software, and that data can live there for a good long time. Okay. Um, so, um, structures is not about visualization, uh, it's about analysis. But I would mention that often a lot of very basic analysis is also amenable to visualization. An example is we do a lot with adherence graphs, just to, to graph out like what fraction of people in the study are still answering surveys after their nth day of the study, you know, say their 10th day, their 11th day, their 12th day, to make sure there's not decreasing you know, decreasing adherence in a big way, right? Um, to look at timelines, I don't know if you remember, I think I have an example here, this sort of timeline. Um, I love timelines. I think they're great for summarizing a bunch of different measures. And 
some lines, Alex, Alex is, is been creating together with Iman, they created a, a, a first step towards a tool to draw timelines for Ethica data, to sort of summarize, as it were, a biography of someone in a way that could knit together multiple types of surveys and sensor data that was measured by them, um, about them, you know, maybe sleep quality or the number of steps they got per day. Um, and, and maybe report you know, when uh, important survey responses were given. And to put it all into one timeline that integrates that more full picture of the person's experience in light of sensor data and uh, events like surveys being delivered or, or time use reports or what have you. So I'm a big believer in the usefulness of those. I can't say we've reached our potential yet, but through the efforts of students such as Alex, we are coming closer to our goal. He exhibits flat affect. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, uh, descriptive statistics. Um, I do a lot of work, I mentioned it earlier, with summary measures. Um, uh, you know, uh, pie charts that summarize what fraction of participants when they answered this EMA answered this way or that way, how many answered other, so I know if that needs to be expanded as a category, et cetera, and study specific metrics. These days, back three years ago, two years ago, these were things that our lab would do and we'd look at, but they weren't really part of the Ethica interface. Now through the great power of Kibana, you can create those study dashboards with those study-specific metrics for what you want to show from your participants and your, you know, your um, uh, reporting measures, whether it's step counts over time, whether it's aspects of their, um, of, of their mobility, where they're spending their time, whether it's components of how they're answering surveys um, or, or components about sleep quality from a wearable, the idea is to be able to have a dashboard that shows what's going on with your study. And I think this is one of the most valuable things you can do to have them, uh, particularly when you supplement with, um, with adherence measures, to summarize what's going on with a study and wh what you need to do to improve it. Um, so I've talked about some basic analysis needs and a conceptual structure of analytics, where it takes place, when it takes place, you know, on the phone versus offline, where it, you know, the level at which it takes place as well. I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the more powerful levels of that of that uh, hierarchy or, or stack, as we call it, a stack, okay? Um, and to do that, with your leave, I'm first gonna take a bite of my croissant. Mm. Okay, so, when it comes to more advanced analytics, there's a set of common questions that motivate this. This is not, this is where I feel I'm really doing you a disservice. These are not exhaustive, they are not privileged, but they are so part of our day-to-day -day securing a value from it that I feel it's important to talk about them. Um, so certain uh, association and an associational analysis, a regression type analysis, for example, certain data features, uh, maybe it's uh, characteristics of a, of a person with outcome, maybe it's predictability of their, their situation, um, or maybe it's clinical outcomes and some aspects of their mobility. If you're looking at frail elderly, where we know that mobility measures have a big bearing on um, health, and, and, and I think the evidence is even there for mortality risk. Um, you know, we might be interested in 
in, in mortality, morbidity outcomes as a result of, of um, um, and, and how, to what degree is that associated with, with aspects of mobility. Um, uh, potentially uh, look at associations of temporally situated events, so, so exposures or contacts with later events. An example might be something like um, my exposure to particulate pollution or to alternatively cold air, um, you know, strongly cold air. Um, uh, and, and US colleagues, when we say cold, we mean cold. Um, <laughs> And uh, or a, or you know another another phenomenon might be a certain geographic location like a feed barn. How is that association? How is how is that associated with later events like occurrence of coughing um, in the next little bit or uh, occurrence of um, of a uh, shortness of breath? Um, or to what degree is exposure as an event? to a, another participant using a cigarette or e-cigarette, or alternatively, to a promotion of e-cigarettes that you've encountered, or cigarettes, to what degree is that associated with a higher likelihood for the next little bit for me to use an e-cigarette? Um, and here, recurrent events analysis comes to play in a central way. Um, hence my students' um, recent focus on that. Um, I mentioned sophisticated summary measures, things like entropy, um, things like exposure indices. Um, these, these can be the subject of some more sophisticated analytics. Um, and there's a, a, there's a notion of, of state space uh, reconstruction that I won't get into in convergent cross mapping which can actually be used to assess causal linkages between variables in a rigorous way based on dynamical systems and, and a technique that um, we've examined critically with a number of examples and have built confidence in. Um, and then there's also network reconstruction, which is something we've done for years and years. Some of Mohammed's earliest contributions were spent reconstructing contact networks from data. Um, uh, within this very institution during the 2009-2010 flu pandemic. Um, and using that to subsequently drive a, um, a model, a simulation model of the spread of flu within that contact network. That was a dynamic network. Um, people were coming into contact and leaving contact. And it was meshed with a dynamic model um, to make sense of it. Okay, so um, I actually think I, I had this slide in that, that other deck, but the idea here is look, we have some time aggregated sensor data, right? We have some data that we, we take a lot of things over time. Maybe it's people's mobility patterns, maybe it's um, their, their aspects of their uh, contacts, and we boil it down, maybe it's their steps over time, and we boil it down to a summary measure. And that summary measure we might use as a, a sort of a covariate associated with that person to understand outcomes. Maybe it's the risk of a cardiovascular event within the subsequent year or something like that. We, we, we tend to do a lot of that. Um, this sort of aggregation tends not to be that difficult. Even for entropy, at a formulaic level, it's pretty straightforward. Um, it could be done in something like R, and uh, the measure can be computed. Although for large amounts of data, we, we do it. We have our own code bases to do it more efficiently. Um, and I talked about entropy and, and predictability, so I won't go into that. I want to talk about machine learning. There's a lot of talk about machine learning these days. These techniques to make sense of data to infer reliably about the world, particularly large amounts of data. These are computational techniques that move beyond the, the, the smaller um, uh, canon, which can be, um, I think, properly considered cognate to it and, and even within it, of statistical techniques and con contains a lot of others like deep learning, hidden Markov models, um, uh, support vector machines, which are really 
very computationally intensive compared to traditional techniques or computationally based. Um, so um, machine learning um, can be used in a lot of different ways for these data. And I've just listed a few here. Inferring, sort of being able to infer from someone's, someone's patterns over time, for example, are they depressed? Is, is this person, um, have, have, they, have they transitioned to clinical depression using data from wearables and from smartphones? Is this, does this person quite likely have a metabolic condition, maybe diabetes? There's been some quite interesting work done by colleagues at MIT on that front. Um, to infer whether this person might be associated with muscular skeletal um, injuries based on their gait, mm -hmm. um, based on how they walk, their accelerometry, taking a look at that and saying, are they, are they suffering from some sort of, of um, in, uh, injury or, or impairment which might need clinical attention, right? Um, uh, are they suffering from a, a mental health disorder, ADHD, uh, some sort of um, um, you know, uh, concern associated with uh, schizophrenia, um, or, or uh, 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 you know, levels of, of, um, of depression or uh, manic uh, depressive disorders. So here, when machine learning is often used to take a whole swack of data and try to, using a computationally intensive techniques, to try to uh, classify, in this case, or infer a more continuous variable on um, some underlying situation here about, say, the person as a whole. Now, that's related to, but different, than another common use we use for Ethica data, which is to classify an underlying situation over time. So the idea here is that over time, my underlying situation evolves. Perhaps for a certain amount of time, I'm sick and for another time I'm, I'm not. Or a certain amount of time I'm suffering from food poisoning, right? Um, or a certain amount of time I have high, highly credible gastrointestinal illness uh, that might be due to uh, waterborne illness. Maybe the underlying situation is a, is a, clinical, um, a clinical situation, a hypoglycemic attack. Um, um, maybe it's something having to do with um, as simple as my posture, or whether I'm indoors or outdoors, or whether I'm carrying the phone or not, or whether I'm in a vehicle or not. These are an underlying situation about my context. Some of them are more low level, like what's my surrounds? Um, you know, am I engaged in really vigorous physical activity or am I just being transported on a bus? You know, um, am I on a slow bus in traffic or am I running you know, running with bionic man speeds. Sorry, that may be lost. Um, I don't know, maybe Cheryl remembers bionic man. <laughs> no, no answer. Okay, Alan, Alan remembers. Um, <laughs> thank you, Alan. I don't tend to make many pop, pop culture references. I never saw the show, I just heard about it. Um, <laughs> I didn't have time for that. Um, uh, so, uh, I, another is predicting outcome. You know, will this person end up with this condition? Oh, another very interesting one from uh, an uh, Erica standpoint might be something like classifying, is this person currently experiencing an apneic event based purely on audio data from, you know, from, from an audio channel, right? If we put the phone next to them during a sleeping time, could we recognize apneic events or hypopneic events um, and, um, using just audio, in which case, you know, there might be avenues to leveraging that for population surveillance for sleep apnea, for example. So here we're classifying a changing situation using machine learning. Um, and this other one, we're, we're predicting an outcome which, um, which might occur at some future point that this is a person who will develop a serious condition, for example. Um, machine learning is, is quite commonly used for the first and the third. Our group does a lot of the second with it, um, a lot of this classification over time. Um, 
and I could show uh, examples here. Um, probably I, I should just to give you a little uh, flavor of this. So I am just going to, um, uh, in fact, I, I, I think I have a slide coming coming up here. Ah, yeah, so it might be, you know, there's some underlying situation where the phone is on my person or off my person, right? And we're trying to classify from Ethica data, am I carrying the phone? And you may wonder, well, that's awfully, you know, uh, sterilized sort of question, is the phone on my person or not? But it tells, if the phone's not on my person and I'm measuring contact patterns with the phone, like the service dog is near the phone, do I really want to say the service dog is near the participant? How do I know? How do, how do I know? I, you know, the participant's not outside mowing the lawn and, and the phone is there. How do I know the participant's not out at a bar and their dog is at home with the phone? And, and we, can't, we can't use the phone as a proxy for them. But if they're carrying the phone and we know the location of the phone, we know something about the participant's location, presumably. If they're carrying the phone, the service dog is nearby, we know something about about that participant that the service dog is nearby, and by extension, um, other things, right? Um, so um, this can be valuable. Um, it's not in the day of wearables. You might have the participant not with the phone, but still be getting other sensor data from wearables. That's perfectly possible. But it, it gives us an understanding of what we're getting through the phone and how representative it is. It might also not be so pr fruitful, productive, to trigger a survey when the phone's not on their person, right? Like, my trigger survey, if they're not around, may not be around to hear it. So it also bears on some operational decisions of significance to Ethica. Here's another example. We classified, so we have a highly successful classifier led by none other than um, William Vanderkamp uh, for classifying someone's posture. Distinguishing sitting, standing, lying down uh, from walking and from off person. I'm not sure why lying down, I guess we excluded it from the analysis because we didn't get enough data for, from all people for that. So here we're classifying like right now, if someone's engaged in sedentary behavior, is it, are they sitting or are they standing? If you want to know something about the effects of walking, of, of standing desks, versus sitting, you might be interested in this, right? Knowing all through a day with a less burdensome means than diarying or observation, you might want to know, are they sitting and standing? And this is something called the hidden Markov model can, um, uh, can, can allow us to classify. So over time, it sort of classifies, okay, you know, at first we're in this state and then we start walking and then we're, we're back in this state and then we sit down for some period of time and we can, we can use that information to maybe come up with metrics. Maybe we don't, maybe our end goal is not to know at this time this person was sitting. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Um, um, but if it's not, we might still come up with metrics which say, you know, um, which give a, a measure of dosing for sitting, standing, lying down, walking for a person. And we might ask for someone who's sedentary and who tends who, you know, and has higher levels of sitting compared to uh, standing and compared to sitting um, or vice versa. Um, how is that associated with? To what degree does it predict certain types of, of uh, health, health, health related measures, right? Um, and and uh, a machine learning model uh, called the hidden Markov model can be very good for trying to infer that sort of information. There's another type which is more sort of um, uh, as, ex as excited, more popular imagination and more current professional enthusiasm called a deep learning model um, that leverages a technique known as recurrent neural networks to do something very similar. The difference is the hidden Markov model is theory-based. The recurrent neural network is more of a black boxy type approach. The recurrent neural network, you don't particularly know you don't give a theory for what's going on and, and, uh, and, and try to get it to match it. And, and instead, it tends to, to, to be trying to match the patterns as best it can without a, a, a big underlying theory. So, so classifying the underlying situation at a given time, either because 
you are trying to know what was going on at that time, like to pop a message or to ask a question or to lend context to a survey they answered. You know, you want to remind them, hey, why don't you get up and walk after you've been sedentary for so long? That's, that's, um, that's a need, or maybe you just want to turn it into a metric of exposure. Does that make sense? And these sort of methods, hidden marker models are well supported within R or SAS, uh, I'm not sure if server SAS, maybe with SAS. Um, but um, they're well supported in Python and, uh, and uh, they, they can be quite useful for classification. Um, I think um, Alex, um, Alex Fled. Yeah, he went to get the coffee. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Uh, um, uh, he, he's done some neat work with snoring data. Um, I'm trying to classify the presence of snoring, absence of snoring um, from audio. Anyway, these are, are um, certain types of, of classifications. Let's, let's talk about dynamic modeling a bit. This is close to my heart. Sorry, question? Was, was there a question? I was saying sleep apps do that now. You know that. Do, detect snoring? Yeah. Yeah. The one thing we've discovered about, about apps there's a huge pressure in commercial industry to make claims that they detect things. And often, comparatively little scrutiny at the end of the day of exactly how accurate it is. Yeah. And this comes down to the heart rate variability thing. People will say, oh, we measure heart rate variability too, or we measure that. And you gotta really be a little bit, and I almost feel jaded about it, but you gotta be, you gotta approach it from a skeptical eye maybe. Maybe not. Let's see, you know, and evaluate it. So I'm perfectly willing to say, yeah, there's probably apps out there that are not bad at that. It's not that hard a problem. Doing it better, doing it more effectively, um, doing it in, in certain temporal sequences or with background noise that's really noisy, maybe another level yet. Because it's one thing to recognize snoring, non-snoring on sleep lab data, nice and quiet in the lab, etc. It's another when there's a TV on in the background, you know, um, uh, kids uh, running around, dogs barking, um, it, you know, um, the sound of an air conditioner, et cetera. And, and so, um, uh, yeah, I, I think there's uh, people working on this. We're not the only ones. And I think it's, uh, uh, there's, I have no doubt that the problem will be solved well and we're pleased to have some degree of contribution, um, but there's a star next to to claims about you know what you what you do, and that has you have to read the fine print sometimes to to know what's meant. Yeah. Or partner snoring. Partner snoring. Partner snoring. So your app is great. Meant to pick you up, but that's right. It's, it's always the partner, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Well spoken as a, as the resident respirologist. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't say resident. She's long past residency. She as the attending respirologist. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, partner, partner snoring. Yes. Um, so quite quite right. And similarly, it's a big difference between detecting you're driving versus you're in a car, for example. You know, with an app. Um, maybe your passenger, maybe your driver, <laughs> very different implications if you're using your app, um, you know, for those. So there's, there's a lot of those, uh, those contexts. Um, dynamic modeling. Um, this is an area I'd be glad to deliver a whole lecture on. For, if anyone's interested, just take me aside and I can go deliver you a lecture, which is quite specific, showing how models come together with this sort of data in several different ways. One way is, is what we call parameterization. Those are the assumptions of the dynamic model. Um, and those parameters, such as transition probabilities or contact networks, to just mention a few, initial state of the model, et cetera, can often be directly evidenced by data collected via the phone, either, um, well, typically with some further analysis. So maybe we'll build a Markov model, we'll get transition probabilities, and we'll put those in to a simulation model as, as parameter values. Or in other cases, we'll do that first level of analysis, first or second level, to get a contact network to recognize when two people are in contact, are they in contact or not, over time. 
and we will turn that into a network over time that we use to feed into the simulation model. Who's in contact with whom over time as the flu pandemic, flu pandemic um, plays out? Something that, that Mohammed uh, pursued in his even younger youth. Um, it's a great uh, success. Calibration, um, by, contact, by contrast here, we're comparing model output, sort of emergent model output, uh, output that's generated by the model against observed data from the world that we want to match. So maybe it's outcomes in the world associated with gastrointestinal illness from foodborne illness, or maybe from, from exposures um, on the beach and in the surf. Um, or maybe it's measures associated with our model, our dynamic model is predicting um, maybe uh, coughing and wheezing outcomes. And we want to make sure that the model matches, um, uh, not only draws on assumptions that, that we gather from the world about people's movement patterns, et cetera. We want to make sure the outcomes in the model match sort of corresponding outcomes for the data. We're, we're using the model to predict them. We want the model that's as predictive as possible. So we'll calibrate this model and calibrate its a certain of its assumptions that are less well pinned down to match that data. Um, a, a final technique that we are very pleased to be some of the earliest ones applying in the health context is uh, filtering techniques. And filtering, it, it's, it's a strange engineering term. And if you hear it, you'll it probably immediately conjure up the wrong notion. Basically what it's doing is it's taking model predictions over time and as data comes in, it's correcting them with, with data, real, sort of real time. The model's predicting this right now. This is what's, uh, what's in fact playing out right now or this gives some indication of what's playing out and it corrects the model's assumption. Now typically, this is with data about the world. It's very incomplete and ambiguous, but that's just the power of it. It allows you to sort of have the model and the data come together to a consensus understanding about the current situation. So then you can predict forward with greater confidence about what's likely coming, knowing everything that's come out now. It's a bit like, you know, um, uh, when we try to judge the weather tomorrow. Um, uh, if, if we wanted to judge the weather tonight, um, it would be a fool's errand to depend on a forecast from last week. I mean, that forecast is now outdated. The world is progressing, so we know a lot more about the situation now than we did last week. So if we want to predict the weather now, we'll, we'll do a lot better um, <coughs> by using the most recent data about the current situation. But we can't live just with that. We have to have a model, a model that sort of says, well, in the next few hours, this cloud cover will clear up, and it will be a beautiful, starry night. Not in a few hours. Sun will still be up, um, and the birds will be chirping. Um, but the point is, when you have a model, it behooves you to ground it in data as it comes out to keep it as current as possible. And that's what filtering does. And filtering using Ethica type data as it comes in is extremely powerful because you know there's a lot of possibilities stochastically, a lot of chance possibilities. But what plays out is a specific thing, and you can ground it using data collected by a tool like Ethica in a way that then grounds the model to look forward. So a lot of the work we do with dynamic modeling these days uses filtering techniques like particle filtering and particle MCMC to, to ground a dynamic model with incoming data in a way that allows it to predict forward most effectively and to ask what if questions. That's what the model is used for, to ask counterfactual questions. If we did this, if we undertook this, this action, uh, outbreak response immunization campaign, what would the impact be? Okay. Um, okay, so here we have this high velocity data, which grounds the model, and we have um, dynamic models the dynamic models broadly make sense of the data at a certain level. The high velocity data grounds those models. They, they sort of, uh, with filtering, they reground it regularly. They provide databases. They help parameterize and calibrate it. Um, but it also, this high velocity data is really useful 
before you have a full model or, or to scrutinize your model, to challenge it as to what needs to be in the model. And often what we get out of the data is very, is very, it's very different than what we expected. I, it was certainly very different in some of the features for many of the studies that I've run. Um, what comes out um, is different from our mental models as captured by dynamic models. So it spurs modeling innovation. And this can allow for some causal inference too, which is uh, exciting, the data. Models, on the other hand, dynamic models can allow for what if questions, can fill the gap sometimes between what's happening, um, uh, understand implications for counterfactuals, and what if questions, um, capture regularities un that are posited to underlie the data. Um, models can also be very use useful for identifying sampling rates. I will tell you this, this is a very sobering fact. And it's a fact that's come out of our lab now in several studies, um, including studies conducted by none other than uh, youth, uh, even more youthful Mohammed Hashemian. So um, it turns out that whilst we are used to dealing with data from the world that's more aggregate in character, and we may reasonably think of this data from smartphones and wearables as a, as a kind of luxury, a kind of um, you know, big step forward in terms of allowing us to ask new types of questions, et cetera. It turns out that for certain spheres of, of the health space, it's this sort of data from smartphones and wearables is a game changer in terms of the conclusions you come to. So there are certain spheres where we view simulation models using data gathered by smartphones and wearables, and we use them to ask what if questions about a variety of policy options, or we use them to predict some out broad outcome measures, number of people you know, drawing ill from a certain condition or what have you. So we, we do it with the most detailed data we have available. And then we ask for the same models, the same tools to ask these research, or to address these research questions. We say, what would, what would our answer have been, what would, what would have our answer coming out of the model have been for the outcome measures or the answer to the what if trade-offs between different interventions? if we had not high velocity data, but lower velocity data, say we had only measurements once a day, rather than once you know, every 10 minutes or every five minutes. Um, what if we had data only um, once a month? What if we had only um, one snapshot of data? How would, our, how would that have affected our research conclusions? If we didn't have this full set of rich data but only an impoverished subset of it, like we do traditionally, um, how would that have affected our outcomes? And the answer for certain areas of, of health decision making was it's like night and day. In other words, having that more fine grained data for certain types of outcomes and certain types of what if questions is a total game changer. It, it totally changes what your conclusion would be. That's sobering because it means that with traditional data sources, more aggregate in character, we may be to a degree flying blind without realizing it. And if we have more accurate data, it will open up much, much, much greater accuracy to the point of being a game changer. So it turns out that this is not by any means a universal rule. It's for certain contexts. And we've been mapping out systematically through the work of none other than Winchell Chen. Um, uh, we've been mapping out what contexts are sensitive to this and which are not. Which are the contexts where having really high velocity better data matters hugely, makes a complete you know, qualitative difference in your, in your findings, and which are the areas where it's, it's pretty much a wash. And there are both. So for example, for respiratory infections, um, something like, uh, nor uh, like uh, H1N1 influenza, or for gastrointestinal, for Norwalk virus. Um, uh, turns out that 
that these are transmitted quick enough and efficiently enough that having really high resolution data for a contact network makes a big difference in terms of how many people you think will, will get sick uh, from it. Whereas um, for something like TB, with long latent periods, long periods between when someone's infected and when they might or might not develop active TB, might never, 90% never develop in their lifetime, 5% within the first five years or so, 5% in the next five years. Um, turns out that's a very slow moving infection and you know, having sensor data is just, it, it, it's, it, it's not, it's not something unique. Um, so there are certain types of contexts where having more, more fine grained data matters a great deal in certain types where it doesn't matter much. In windshell, ladies and gentlemen, is the king of this area, like so many others. Um, okay, so um, those are just you know some basic comments there. I'm glad to give you know for those who who want to know in more detail, look in, uh, at an example of how it informs models. I'm glad to to talk about it in in greater detail um, in a separate uh, in in a parallel session here. Um, okay, machine learning class virus I talked about. Um, um, so these, these um, hidden Markov models and classification of the underlying state, am I indoors or outdoors, am I in a vehicle or not, what sort of activity am I engaged in in terms of um, walking, uh, running, um, uh, sedentary uh, behaviors such as sitting or standing, etc. Turns out that, that those sort of models can be really useful to help us build effective dynamic models as well, simulation models that are um, uh, that that help us reason out counterfactuals. So um, these can be used to provide um, data to calibrate a dynamic model, to deduce transition rates within dynamic models, and to develop dynamic hypotheses for what's going on uh, in the external world. Um, and I mentioned um, some of these, yeah. Um, um, I will note that these machine learning models, I should have mentioned this earlier in classifying this thing. One of the claims to fame of these is that one of the reasons these techniques are so powerful to classify what's going on at one, any one time is because the individual pieces, this is an important insight from, from Ethica and other types of big data, Often, a given measurement from Ethica will be very ambiguous as to what's going on. Are you sitting in a very, in an unusually active way, like you know, you're rotating your chair, or you're shifting your position while sitting, or are you standing in a quieter fashion, uh, maybe uh, standing, leaning against the wall or something? These are things that might individually be ambiguous from one measurement. But what machine learning allows us to do is, if we look at successive measurements, maybe any one of them is ambiguous. This is a lot more likely to be sitting, this is a distribution function, um, than, uh, than it is to be uh, standing, for example. But as we get more data in, each measurement is ambiguous, but we start to see many measurements, and we reason about the fact that even a highly energetic lecturer does not stand up and sit down, you know, on an order of seconds, you know. Um, uh, and uh, it, there's there's a certain human time constant for between how how frequently we switch between, say, sitting and walking, or sitting and standing, or being off person. You know, um, if I have a smartphone. I may put it down and pick it up occasionally within a second, but by and large, if, I'm, if I put it down, I put it down for a couple minutes often. Um, and so once you reason about that regularity, the fact that you know, we're not just engaged in bizarre contortion switching between these states, you can start to reason about these regularities, start to total up the picture for many particular observations and start to get out a consistent picture of what's likely going on here. Um, that someone is likely standing there individually, 
um, ambiguous measures, but some that are that are um, not so um, that are that are pretty uh, pretty clear. Um, so, yeah, a wide variety of techniques exist to, to classify these data. We work uh, in our lab with a wide variety of types. Uh, Narges has done some great work with support vector machines for several projects. Uh, Bayesian and naive Bayesian models, both at hierarchical Bayesian and naive Bayesian. Uh, hidden Markov models, recurrent neural networks for classifying things over time. And I'd love to get into continue, uh, uh, conditional random fields sometimes. Um, anyway, um, uh, we, for these sort of data, we, we've done a fair number of experiments that have been ground truth experiments. Narges has been very uh, helpful in, in some of these, um, uh, in William and others. So here, we're actually collecting data so that we can classify better. So the idea is that maybe we, we ask people to record when they're through our, uh, an ecological momentary assessment, experience sampling, are you indoors or outdoors right now? And based on those, that data that's built up, those samples, maybe it's thousands of samples, tens of thousands of samples, as to what an indoor environment looks like to Ethica, you know, with the Ethica lens. What does it look like in terms of Wi-Fi signal strength, GPS strength, light levels at different times, you know, um, levels of noise, you know, pressure, uh, temperature for phones that have it, or what have you. Um, uh, we, we learn what those environments look like, indoor, outdoor, with ground truth data. This is like labeled data. We say, this is indoors. We know that with confidence. That is outdoors. We know that with confidence. And based on that, you can create a classifier. It's a machine learning classifier. And it says, for this data that's not labeled, I bet it's indoors, because that looks just like typical indoor data. Um, others, it might be more in, uh, uncertain about. This is the basic idea behind ground truth. And you're collecting lots of confidently labeled data, so you can, as it's called, train a classifier, and then evaluate, scrutinize, uh, critically evaluate the performance of a classifier, and then find variants that are even better. And so that's what machine learning is largely about. You're, you're taking data, you're dividing it into parts. This part you use to train, that part you use to evaluate, and you try to find better versions of that model by, by adjusting your assumptions in the classifier. And ground truth data is very valuable for that. So we've used Ethica and its predecessors to capture a fair bit of ground truth data, quite a lot. Um, you might have ground truth data, for example, on coffin. Um, or ground truth data that's collected on, um, uh, on vehicular use. Um, ground truth data related to sitting, standing, lying down, uh, in all sorts of different contexts. Um, very useful, and Ethica can be a powerful tool for collecting that. Um, in other cases, the ground truth data may come from clinical contexts, which are known. For example, snoring data from sleep lab studies, which have been annotated by a trained technician or by a clinician for, you know, this is a period of snoring or this is an apneic period and, and by implication this is not an apneic period and you're trying to, you're trying to create a classifier for those. Okay. So, um, ground truth data is something we collect sometimes to enable our classification experiments. Um, and uh, sometimes we generate data from simulation models, like any logic models, to generate data and then test our classifiers using that, uh, that data. And it turns out there's this technique of uh, pseudo-residuals statistically that can be very, very useful. Um, okay. Um, I have lots and lots of other slides, but no time to really do them justice. Um, what I am providing you, I'll just tell you, I'm providing you a whole swack of other slides. Um, these include a discussion for dozens of research questions that we have come up with in various studies and various studies that have been asked. Um, uh, what tools we use. Oh, did I? 
Did I delete a slide? Maybe. Okay. Um, so I, I, I sort of list, okay, for this question, these are the techniques we've used, or these are the techniques that are recommended, okay? That's this analysis task, the sampling that I'm going to be providing to you. Um, uh, another, another one involves, um, uh, involves this sort of luxury or necessity question. Um, uh, and I talked about uh, sensor, uh, sensor data. Oh, and then how does data interface with dynamic models? I, I have some slides on that. Um, but um, I have exhausted uh, my time and quite possibly your patience. Um, so I'm grateful for that. Um, well, we're going to have a break. And from the break, we will uh, break into project work. Um, if anyone wants to talk with you more about this, wants to go into more detail about any parts of it, I'm, I'm happy to be taken off and, um, oh, that sounds like an unfavorable end, taken off and drawn and quartered or something, but taken off and, and you know, I can, I can uh, reserve a room and I can give a talk or, or engage in discussion about more detailed uh, comments on the, the analysis uh, front. How is all of, I, I guess I should say, in, in my closing um, uh, two or three minutes here, how do we do this analysis vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, vis -vis, uh, Ethica's databases? Well, there's basically um, uh, three, uh, three big ways, okay? One is there's certain types of analysis Certain types of very, very basic analysis, which you can perform within Ethica directly. You know, things like via Kibana, it can compute fractions of people who answered the certain survey a certain way. Or of those who answered survey A, survey question A this way, what fraction of them answered survey B question this, this certain way, okay? Those are basic statistics that we used to actually you know, bring out big iron to compute because you couldn't do it in Ethica. Now you can do it as part of Kibana. And, 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 and that gives you something um, right there, part of a dashboard or just, you know, measures you, you use uh, episodically. Other types of data, we, we do a lot of work um, working with the Ethica database and linking often the Ethica database to external databases. Maybe they're weather databases, maybe they're databases on particular matter, you know, measures of particular density or pollution uh, in the ocean. Maybe there are measures associated with um, clinical outcomes for patients. Alan's done some of that. Um, and you're linking up Ethica data in the databases with these, these external data often and conducting analysis. And Tina is a queen at conducting this analysis, but uh, quite a few of my other students, um, uh, Narges and Young, for example, have done quite a lot of uh, analytics. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, there you're issuing queries against the database and getting data. And often that's conducted in R or Spark, or it's conducted in, um, in Python. Um, a third type of analysis would involve you download that data. So you go to the Ethica website. Um, Mohammed showed how you do it. You request certain data to be downloaded. It's downloaded, and you load that into your favorite package, Stata, SAS, R, Spark. Python, and and you can do the analysis in that. Um, often there you're downloading different data sets that are drawn by time and person, and you link them together in R data frames or what have you, and, and, and you conduct them. Um, pretty uh, straightforward. Sometimes we take that data and we put it into Tableau or a tool like that, but Kibana has, has largely uh, over, overtaken our needs uh, on that front. Okay, um, so um, it is uh, three o'clock. We can take a bit of time. Alex uh, showed um, um, uh, a, a set of uh, um, beverages outside, so uh, people can make use of them. And we will now engage in project uh, project work.
and let me know if you want me to expand on any pieces of this in a parallel session. Thank you very much.